Sim. Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. A um, few announcements before uh, I, I get into the communion meditation this morning. Um, my class, uh, second uh, service, will meet over in the other building uh, this morning. So if you're a part of that class and uh, or if you didn't join us last week and you want to join us today, that's great. And uh, you can come over. Just enter the front of the building, the double doors up the steps, and uh, don't come through the middle. We've got jars of clay meeting, and it would be best if we avoided the, the foyer, the hallway. And uh, I'll let you use the bathroom if you need to. Um, that is, you know, we'll, we'll work something out. And so anyway, we'll, uh, we'll see how that does. Um, but uh, please, uh, join us over there for um, uh, second service for the for the Bible study. Uh, we're studying, of course, the case for Christ. And of course, Rob's study is meeting right now uh, in the kitchen. So uh, a few other announcements that we have. Workday is next Saturday. Uh, this is from 8 to 12. Uh, many hands make light work. I know it's cliche, but it's cliches are there for a reason because they're true and so uh, if you'll come out and help out uh, we'll we'll promise you that you'll you'll get this glow like planet fitness um, describes and um, you'll 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 just feel good about yourself and so uh, we no, we get to serve the Lord through service and through cleaning up and through making stuff right and so if you want to come out next week 8 to 12 on Saturday morning we'll be uh, figuring out some things uh, Rob already has a ton of stuff and others already have a ton of stuff that need to be done so please come out and join us for that we would love to have you crop walk is next Sunday uh, next Sunday at 2 p.m. And if you've not signed up yet and you want to walk or you want to raise money for it, there's still time. You can see Amy, uh, who's right here. You can see Kevin, who's back on the uh, projector. Um, talk to them. Uh, we've got a couple of teams you could be a part of. One right here at the church we want you to be a part of. And, uh, but if for some reason you don't want to do that, you can join Amy's team. <laughs> so uh, Amy, I think, is running uh, a separate team. So anyway, talk to them, figure it all out, and uh, let's walk and uh, feed hungry people. And uh, that, that's, that's something Jesus would do, right? He did it twice in, in the Gospels, at least. So let's do that. Uh, also, we are proud to announce that our pop-up, uh, our pop-up, we're going to have a pop-up on October uh, the 6th, and that's oh, on October 5th, I'm sorry. And that's going to be at 6 p.m. Um, and it's going to be at the silos in Oriental. Now, um, we know the owners of the silos really well, and they are really excited. They have an outdoor area. We'll bring a movie for the kids. We'll do something like, I don't know, some, some movie. And uh, but they have an outdoor seating area called the Rooster. I'm not sure why it's called the Rooster. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll enjoy it. They have cornhole and different stuff like that. They're going to do a buffet. For those who come, uh, it's going to be spaghetti and pizza, and so um, and it's going to be discounted for kids. So I know that's way out there for some of you, and I understand. But if you plan on it now, you'll be able to attend. And our pop-up events are always fun. So if you want to come to that, uh, please plan on that. It's October 5th at 6 p.m. Finally, today, this month, is um, for our missions uh, uh, program. Every month we try to highlight another mission, and this month is Waypoint. And uh, it's Waypoint Church Partners, and uh, I'm glad to represent Waypoint. I am the East Coast um, representative uh, on the board of directors right now for Waypoint. We had a meeting this past week, and I said, how can I present the Waypoint? They gave me a t-shirt. So anyway, um, that's... Uh, and Stephanie got one too, so she's wearing hers. But uh, if you if you are interested in learning more about Waypoint, uh, I'm not going to go into it here because this is communion time. Um, long story short, Waypoint builds churches, plants churches, and helps churches. And so it may be on a level that you don't see a whole lot, but they do a lot of good. And uh, if you want to know more, please tell me, and uh, I would be willing to explain more about Waypoint and what we do. And uh, I'm really excited to represent Waypoint. They do a lot of good work. So if you notice, I'm sweating. My heart rate is 103. And the reason for that is because I've been trying to set up over there for our class this morning. I had tested the speaker system, and the speaker system worked earlier in the week. It, it gave, it, we get feedback over there, and it wasn't bad. But, man, this morning I turned it on, and I thought the windows were going to fall right out of the building. It was that bad. And so I rushed over here, and I asked Rob. I was like, Rob, where's that, little, where's that speaker? And he was like, well, you can take this one. So I rushed back over and hooked it up, and I got the cords backwards, and I was sitting there looking at it, and I, and I got them right. And then I ran back over here, and I stood beside Stephanie, and Stephanie said, you are sweating. Do you want me to go get you a, a, a napkin or a towel? And I said, no. I said, I'll go get it. And then I thought, no, it works into the communion meditation today. Communion is one of those things where we're running through life so hard, right? I mean, I, we've had a busy week. Next week's going to be a busy week. And my next week is going to be a really busy week. And when you, when you look at your time and how you spend it and go, 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 we ask you at communion to slow down and stop. But it's hard to do, right? 
Have you ever seen skid marks leading into a, an exit lane from a big truck trying to make the exit lane, and they're slamming on brakes, and it's like, you know, and you tell where the tires hit, and it skidded across the road? And maybe you did that. Maybe you did it this morning. I, I don't know. Uh, maybe you, should, you should drive slower. But um, I, I always think that sometimes it's almost like I, run so, I, I can run so hard that I fall in bed at night, and then I get up and I run so hard that I never really slow down. Even in trying to sleep, you don't slow down. And it's all just one big blur. And communion is where we're supposed to put on the brakes. Communion is where we're supposed to slow down and recognize what Jesus has done for us. The reason that we still ask you to get up and go get your communion instead of passing it around like we did pre-COVID is because it allows other people and yourself a moment. It allows you a moment to walk up, get your communion, sit back down, and either have some time before or some time after that you can just sit for a second in, in hopefully a, a peaceful environment that you can just focus on who Jesus is and what he's done. And so, I don't know how your life is going. I know how some of your lives are going. But I don't know where you're at. But just, just stop for a second and listen to the words that are written in Titus chapter 3. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of, our God, of, of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. That's a promise that sticks. That's a hope that we have. And today, as we partake of communion, we remember what Jesus did for us. It's a time for us to put on the brakes and stop and say, Lord, this moment is yours. This moment and hopefully every moment is yours. So that no matter how fast we go, we're able to softly put on those brakes and stop and say, Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today that we get to take communion. Lord, let us slow down. Let us remember your promise. Let us remember what you've done. And help us always, Father, to remember Jesus, who saved us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please retrieve the emblems, uh, if you would, outside starting first, and then we'll partake together.
the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body. In the same manner, he took the cup, drank from it, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Pray with me again, please. Thank you, Father, for this meal, for this feast. Lord, for our spirit and our soul. Lord, may we reflect upon you all the days of our life. May we honor you all the days of our life. And may we continue to surrender to you all the days of our life. Forgive us when we move too fast. Help us to be slow and to wait upon your promises. It's in Jesus' name we pray. How do you know, <clears throat> excuse me, how do you know you're living on mission? Do you even know what the mission is that God gives us? I mean, do, do you know because, you know, <clears throat> it's a feeling? Maybe you feel like you're on mission. Maybe you, maybe you feel good about life. Is there some sort of sign that you get from God? Like one day he, you know, reaches down and smacks you on the back of the head and says, hey, Here's what I want you to do. How do we really know that we're on mission? Maybe it's like the man who stood, or stood in the pastor's office and then had a seat in front of his desk and put his hands on his knees and looked intently at the pastor and, and said, said, Pastor, I can't stand listening to anyone else preach. Does that mean I'm supposed to be a preacher? How do we know? that we're on mission. See, too many times we get so caught up in the little things of life. I appreciated Scott's communion meditation because I don't rest well. I have a hard time resting. I, I'm a constant. I go, go, go in my sleep. <laughs> I can feel my body tingling when I'm sleeping because like, I'm anxious about the next day, about what's going to happen. I don't rest well. And I think sometimes, though, to understand mission, it takes you to stop and pay attention. To maybe slow down just a bit so that you can hear God speak. How do you know you're on mission? However we discover that answer, one thing is true. That all of us, every single one of us in this room this morning that is a Christian is called to be on mission. We're all called to the mission God has given us. And I love how sometimes that looks different for everyone. We have the same mission, don't we? Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, Jesus says. That's the mission of the church. But what does that look like in each and every individual's life? That's the beauty that we find in Scripture, that, that God gives us each gifts to be used for those reasons. So the mission that God has given me to fulfill of making disciples may look a little bit different than what you do. But nonetheless, it's our mission. And the beauty of the mosaic feel of everybody's gifts coming together in the church to accomplish that one mission, what a beautiful, beautiful thing. So I want to encourage you that as we go through today's sermon, keep asking yourself, am I living on mission? Am I living on mission? Does my life reflect God's call on my life? Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity that we have to worship you in this way through your word. God, you've given us all that we need in this life to have success, not according to worldly standards, but according to your will. May we always remember that. 
This is not about us. This is always and always will be about you. Lead us and help us to obediently follow you, Jesus. Make this church, Broad Creek Christian Church, make this church a church on mission to reach those in need for your glory, Jesus. It's your name we pray. Amen. In our passage today, we see a turning point. We see a turning point because before this, we have 12 chapters of, of fulfillment happening. These three keys we've been talking about over and over again to the kingdom. We see the church receiving their instruction in Acts 1.8, but you receive power when you receive the Holy Spirit, and you will be my witnesses in all of Judea and Samaria, or Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We have that, that command to go and take this. And so that's what they do. They, they begin in Jerusalem, don't they? The day of Pentecost. And they remain there. They remain there sharing the message, helping people see Jesus as who he is supposed to be looked at as, helping people understand that it's by his grace and, and that, that you are saved, not by any works that you do. That mission in Jerusalem is being fulfilled. Then we see it go to Judea, and we see it go to Samaria, and we see just a little bit of the ends of the earth right there at the, at the end of, of chapter 11 and, the verse, and chapter 12. But here we see this blown wide open. It is now the ends of the earth. It is now time for the Gentiles to fully understand this Jesus. Because now the church is in mission mode, completely and utterly sold out to the call of Christ. The ends of the earth, wide open. Jerusalem at first is the center of this all, isn't it? Don't they send the apostles back and, and to and from Jerusalem? These are where their station, this is where they receive information. This is where Paul and or Saul at this time and Barnabas take all the stuff that's collected to help those in the famine to be distributed. But now we see a turning point in chapter 13. It's no longer Jerusalem that's the hub. Jerusalem's always important, but the hub becomes Antioch. And we see Peter, he's faded out of the picture. If it was a western, it'd be like he's leaving in the sunset. He's faded out of the picture. And a new leadership takes place. Really, a new central figure. His name is Saul. This is a turning point in the church. At this turning point, if this never happened... I'm, I'm convinced you and I don't exist. Because this church was about mission. It was about reaching the ends of the earth as Jesus commanded them to do. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter 13. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12, but we're going to break it up a little bit. So verses 1 through 3 to begin with. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Barnabas... Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So at the beginning of this passage, we have the setting in Antioch, this church, Luke is quick to tell us, here's, here's what's happening here. Here's some of the key leaders in this church. There's five men that are, are mentioned here. Barnabas, we know who Barnabas is, the son of what? Anybody? Not thunder. Encouragement. The son of encouragement, Barnabas. If you got the answer, shout it, right? 
the son of encouragement. This is Barnabas. Barnabas is a key leader. And I'm also going to let you know that, in my opinion, there is no, no small reason that these people are listed the way they are. It's important that we understand that they're listed because it's lists of importance in the church in Antioch at this very moment. So we have Barnabas. We have Simeon, also called Niger. Many believe that Simeon was an African man. Because Niger means black. So quite possibly we have the first black man as a leader in the early church. We have Lucius, possibly the founder of the Antioch church. Because if you look in Acts chapter 11, verse 20, it says that in, in two men or men came from Cyprus and they came from another place. And what did they do? They came to Antioch and they did what? They preached Jesus to the people of Antioch, to the Gentiles. So maybe Lucius was the first founder of the church. Manian, Manian's an interesting character. Who is he a childhood friend of? Herod. Which Herod? It was Herod Antipas. This is the same Herod that had John the Baptist beheaded. Manian is a childhood friend of Herod Antipas. And this is interesting to me because you couldn't have two, two people so different. And actually in the Greek, this childhood hood friend may have actually been a connotation for a, maybe a foster child. So quite possibly Manian was raised with in the same household of Herod as a foster child. Quite possibly. And then we have Saul. Notice Saul is listed last. Remember, in Jewish culture, lists matter. Names matter. Saul is listed last. Barnabas is first. Saul is last. We get into chapter 14. In a, in a few weeks, you'll understand this because the people of Lystra look at Saul and Barnabas as Barnabas Zeus and Saul who? Hermes. Zeus is the greater God, is he not? In Greek culture? Yes. So it's interesting to me how this list is the way it is. Because Saul becomes such a pivotal and, and centered figure in our faith. Is that anything he has done? No. I think it has a lot to do with mission. These are prophets and teachers that Luke says. Prophets and teachers are in this church. Now the prophets, they set the foundation of truth. They set the foundation for teaching the word of God. These prophets at this time did way less foretelling and much more forthtelling. Meaning that what they were doing was setting a foundation of truth. Preparing hearts for the word. Reiterating to the people what is already truth. Not, necess not necessarily saying in 20 years you're going to have this happen to you. See, we get messed up in the church today when we talk about prophecy. We only think one way. We only think it's future. That's not the case, church. And there are many churches across the nation meeting right now that are teaching that very, very thing, that prophecies only has to do with the future, and that's not true. Prophecy has everything to do with what you're living now, the foundation you have, what God has already said, because I can tell you, there is nothing going to happen that isn't already said to us right here. Amen? Amen? The Holy Spirit will never give another person a word of something that does not match his word. That is not the Holy Spirit. That is a satanic spirit. So you have to learn to decipher and to discern the spirits. 
If it doesn't match the word of God, it is not a spirit of God. We have to be careful. The teachers, they helped ground those new converts. They took them through the Torah. They took them through the Tanakh. They took them through the the word of God to show them what it meant to live for God. These teachers, here's my favorite word, they discipled new believers. They didn't say, congratulations, you're a Christian, now get out of here. They discipled new believers. They sat with them, they prayed with them, they cried with them, they laughed with them, they taught them. That was the mission of the church, was it not? Go make what? Disciples. Not just go make converts. Go make disciples. And this is, this is reiterated at the end of, of Matthew 28 when Jesus says, and teach them to what? Obey everything he did what? Commanded us, right? That's discipleship. They were worshiping and fasting. In the New American Standard, it says they were ministering unto God. It's interesting to me when we talk about that. How do we minister to God? How do we minister to God? The word used in the Greek means to serve. It means to worship. And it's not just an aspect of your life. It's all that you are. So here's these these people in this church that are in Antioch that are are worshiping God. They're ministering to him. And at the same time as they're worshiping and ministering to God, they are fasting. Because they know that at this time, at this moment, they're trying to seek God's will. They're trying to seek the mission of God. And so anything that comes along can be a distraction, including the food. So what do they do? They fast. And they pray. And they worship, and they minister to God. They give him everything they are. And as they do this, as they fast, as they worship, they hear the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit tells them to take Barnabas and take Saul and separate them, set them apart. And send them out. Send them out where? To the mission. You see, everybody in that church had a role, didn't they? Everybody. Whether it was worshiping, fasting, and praying, teaching, prophesying, or going. Everybody had a role. So the Holy Spirit speaks to them. And now, I want you to understand that there's, there's no, <laughs> it might be shocking for some, there's no evidence that this is an actual audible voice. I think that's another mistake we make in the church today. We try to listen for God, and we listen wrongly. We're always trying to hear voices. We're always trying to hear things. And I'm not denying that God doesn't do those things. I'm saved because I was in my living room and I audibly heard a voice said, Dan, go to church camp. And it scared the tar out of me. So what did I do? I went to church camp. I'm not going to deny anybody who's ever heard those types of things. But what I am going to say is we got to be careful on how we try to listen for God. We can't sit there and just intently try to listen for a voice because his voice speaks through his words. His voice speaks through you and I together, living in community, praying for one another, encouraging one another. It's truly a beautiful thing, church. One day we will be with him face to face with the creator and we will see and we will hear him. But until then, he speaks. He speaks through you and me. The point is, are you listening? Are you trying to hear just voices? Or are you truly listening to God? Are you truly seeking his mission? 
I promise you, if you seek it, you will find it. We just have to learn to drown out the noise and to slow down, to genuinely live in community. Because I guarantee they didn't look at each other and say, well, Saul, you have this weird way of saying words, so I don't really want you going out and speaking to people. Or, or you know, Barnabas, you kind of dress funny, so, so we're going to have to change your, yeah, we're going to have to change your clothes a little bit to, to make it to where you're more presentable to people. There was no concern of this. There was no concern in looking at people and saying, you just don't fit the bill that we're trying to portray, so, so you know what, you know, we're going to go to these types of people, so, so we don't need you doing this, we're going to have this guy. It was, are you willing? Is God calling you? Okay, let's bless you and go. See, in churches, we get so caught up in how we present things, mainly ourselves, that we lose the mission. We get so caught up in money and politics and all this other stuff that doesn't need to get in the way of the gospel. So when I look at the early church, I am envious, if I, if I will admit, that they just pray and they fast and they understand and they hear and then they send. So I don't believe this was an audible voice they heard. I believe that because they were union, uh, unionized, unionized, that's a terrible word, in union with one another, not unionized, <laughs> in union with one another, because they were in one accord, because they were in one heart and one mind, as they were praying, they all heard the same call from within that Barnabas and Saul need to be sent away. And you only know those things, church, if you live in community with each other. We can get away with coming to church every Sunday, saying our highs, shaking our hands, giving our hugs, talking behind each other's backs. Did you see what we did today? We can get away with that for the next 20, 30, 40 years. And we may function for a long time. But that's not mission, is it? We need each other. You can't come through these doors and just ignore everybody and be healthy as a Christian. You can't come through these doors and just go through the motions and be healthy as a Christian. It takes sacrifice. It takes time. It takes a willingness for community true community where we serve together, pray together. That's when our faith will start to come alive because that's how we're intended to live. The early church got that. They knew that when they started, if they didn't have one another centered on Christ, they were going to be driven out. They were going to be destroyed. They needed one another. For us to be on mission, we must understand that the first job of a servant is to serve the Lord. What do they do? What do these, these people in this church do, led by these five men? They first go and they worship the Lord and they fast. They minister unto God. And then they fast and they pray. Yet what do we do? We hold committee meetings. What are we going to do? All right, sounds good. We're going to have this event at this time, and, and this is what we need, so we're going to plug people in here. We need volunteers for this. Uh, we need money for this. Uh, let's collect some, uh, some candy for the, uh, for the, uh, the event, or, or let's collect, collect candy for, for this. Or let's, we go through all this list of stuff, and what do we always forget to do? We don't pray, we don't fast, we don't worship. I'm just as guilty as this, of this. I've got ideas coming out everywhere. I'm telling you, ask Kevin. Kevin's always coming, what, what, what should we do? And I'm just like, Bleh. here you go. But what good 
are those things if they're not bathed in worship to the king? If we're not seeking his will and his mission in those, maybe God doesn't want us doing that. So we can learn early through our worship and our fasting or our prayer and our union together, or we can learn late as we try to put this event on and it just falls flat on its face. We have to, church, worship the Lord before we do anything else. We have to pray. We have to fast. If we want to know the mission, that's where we've got to be. That's what the early church did. To be on mission requires us to listen. As they're worshiping and fasting, what, what are they doing? They're listening for God. Imagine that. Like We'd be praying and like, are you, the, are, you ever meet that person that just talks, talks, and talks, but you, when you're trying, you're like, uh, 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 and they talk and they talk and they talk, but they don't listen to a word you say? I think a lot of times our prayer lives are like that. That we talk and we talk and we talk and we ask and we ask and we ask and we never just slow down and listen. Or maybe if we add fasting in there, if we do, I mean, that's a big if in the modern church today. If we add fasting in there, we kind of get this complex about ourselves. Look at me, I'm fasting. I can do this. You're giving yourself a pet talk instead of allowing God to seep in. We've got to listen. And it's in those times of listening that we will hear the Spirit speak. Because part of listening is getting into this. Part of listening is allowing God to speak to us. And we will hear our mission. We will hear it. To be on mission requires us to submit. And in order to listen, we have to focus on that worship, that service to God, that, that submittance to him. This is how you enter into a life on mission. Verses 4 through 12. So being out by the Holy Spirit, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived in Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn to the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was called Paul, that's interesting, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Barnabas and Saul, along with John. Now this John, we've talked about him before. He's come up a couple times. It's not John the Apostle, but it's John Mark, also called Mark. Most believe it was Peter who maybe converted Mark to the faith, which is why Mark's gospel is an account of what Peter tells him. But this is John Mark. Along with John Mark, Barnabas and Saul, they go to Seleucia. Seleucia is about 20, 21 miles away from Antioch. It's a port city. So as they go out on mission, it's, it's their equivalent of getting to the airport so they can get to where they need to be. They're, they're going to Seleucia, and there they take a boat, and they go to the island of Cyprus. 
This is the homeland to who? Anybody know? Starts with a B and rhymes with Barnabas. <laughs> Barnabas. It's Barnabas' homeland. So why they go to Cyprus, we're not sure. Maybe it's, maybe it's Barnabas saying, hey, that's my homeland. We should go there. There's a lot of people who need Jesus there. I don't know. Maybe the Spirit, and it's not recorded, maybe the Spirit spoke to both of them and said, Cyprus is where I want you to go. At any rate, they go to Cyprus, and they go to a town, a synagogue in Salamis. And they get, they're able to speak the word of God in the synagogue. And this is interesting to me because you have Christian people, okay, who are Jewish Christian people going to synagogue, which that was a normal thing for Jewish Christians to do in that time. And they're asked to speak. And most of the time it's Paul that speaks in the, in the synagogues. What was Paul, Saul, before he became a believer? A Pharisee. Do you think he ever spoke in a synagogue? Probably. Do you think he has a, a reputation in the synagogues? So when Saul comes in and Barnabas comes in, maybe they look at him and say, hey, you want to speak today? Do you want, you want to bring the word today? And Saul says, oh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do that. And in his mind, he's like, it's all about Jesus. You know, he's saying, and he's getting really excited. And so he begins to speak, and we don't know the, the outcome to this. We're not told. We're not told if 3,000 people come to the Lord that day. We're not told if he's kicked out of synagogue. We're not given that information. All we know is that he spoke in synagogue. So this is on the, the northeast side of the island of Cyprus. Pretty soon they find themselves going to the southeast side, to this, to this little city called Pat, Paphos. And there they met a false prophet and a Jewish magician named Bar-Jesus. Now if you knew this, but Jesus was a very common name in that day. It means Joseph. Bar-Jesus means son of Jesus, son of Joseph. You also notice that Luke only calls him this one time. Once. And I think that's just for the audience to know that, okay, this is what this guy was. He has another name for him, Elemas. Elias, Elamus, however you want to say it. But he meets this guy, and then he meets the, the proconsul, the, the Roman official, named Sergius Paulus. And Sergius Paulus calls them to himself to say, hey, listen, I want to know about this, this God. Can you, can you speak to me the word of God? He's, he's interested in this. But this, this magician, Elemis, what, what is he? He's, he's a kind of a right-hand man to, to this proconsul. He's, he's the guy that gives him all of his information. He's the guy that when the proconsul's having a hard time saying, you know, I don't know what to do, and he's, he's over there going, you know, whatever he does with magicians did at that time and saying, this is what you need to do. And he, he said, go and do that. And so he would listen to him. But I think he's getting tired of doing that because maybe things aren't going the way they're supposed to go. And he hears about this Paul, or this Saul and, and Barnabas coming into the city. So he's like, hey, bring them over to me. I want to listen to what they have to say. And Elemas gets jealous, doesn't he? It's what it is. And he tries to stop the proconsul for hearing and understanding. And in verse 9, we have an interesting passage here because this is the first time we see Saul called Paul. This isn't a name change like we see in the Old Testament with, with, with some of the characters. This isn't a name change like, like Peter got or, or this... Paul is the Gentile way, the Greek way of saying Saul. That's all it is. Saul was named after the King Saul because King Saul was in the line of the Benjamites. Benjamites, okay? And that's the line that Saul was a part of. He was a direct descendant from Saul, so he was named after the first king of Israel. But Paul is his Greek name. And he starts going by that from here on out. Why? Because I think the mission requires it. 
But also, Saul in Greek has a connotation that it's a, it's a homophobe for a, a word that, me, that means strut of a prostitute. I don't know if you knew that. That's just general information for you. So maybe he's like, yeah, we're not going there. I'm not going to let the Greeks call me Saul. <laughs> but nonetheless, this is a turning point. And he looks at Elamis, Elamis and very intently in the eyes. Saul's about to lay a gospel smack down. And this is beautiful. What does bar Jesus mean? Son of Jesus. What does Saul say? What does Paul say? Acts 13.10. You son of the devil. You are not even worthy to have the name bar Jesus. You son of the devil. You enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Paul has had it. He has had it with this guy's villainy and lies and deceit. And then he curses him and says, You're going to be blind. You won't see the sun. And immediately mist comes and he's blinded. And what does it say he does? He wanders away looking for someone's hand to guide him. I kind of get the picture that nobody's there. Just kind of wandering along trying to find somebody to guide him. And it's at this time that the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, sees what's happening. And he accepts. He believes. His life has changed. That whole experience is kind of like what Paul went through, wasn't it? I, I, get, this, I get this idea that when, when Paul is talking to him and rebuking him and telling him he's going to be blind, maybe he sees a little bit of himself. Maybe in the back of his mind he says, I too once was lost. And you know what helped me? I went blind. So you're going to be blind. You're going to be blind. You're not going to see the sun. So maybe Paul in his mind is saying, maybe this is how this man finds Jesus. It's kind of an eerie parallel, isn't it? Paul knows exactly what it's like. Because he was there. This event is a great picture as well, the parable of the weeds in Matthew chapter 13. Because in the fact that wherever the word of God is proclaimed, wherever the children of God are there, guess what's also going to be there? The weeds. The people who, who oppose God. And so church, what we've got to realize is that we have to stand up to that. We have to be bold against the lies. We have to be bold against the, the enemy. We can't sit here within the walls of our church week in and week out and just sit here and learn and, and laugh and sing and cry together and do all those things together while everybody else is going to hell. We are the children of God and we're going to be opposed because that's what's going to happen because truth is always opposed. So what we need to do is we need to learn and grow in here so that they, we may leave out there and share people with people the word of God to, to confront sin boldly. That's what we need to do. That's the mission. To understand that the souls of people are worth fighting for. And if you're here this morning as a non-believer, I want to tell you, you are worth fighting for and we're going to fight for you. We want you to know that there is one way and his name is Jesus. Without Jesus Christ, you have no hope. And I will be so bold to tell you that without Jesus, you are on a path of destruction. So I'm asking you, do you want life? 
will fight for you. We have to understand, church, it's time to be so bold that the gospel, the gospel is the reason people turn to Jesus. Not what we're doing, but the gospel. Notice that Sergius Paulus, he sees the event and he believes and he's astonished at what? The teaching of the Lord. It wasn't the event necessarily, the the miracle. It was the gospel. That's the power of the gospel message. That broken people like us can go and share with people the life that they can have and they can believe not because of broken people but because of a perfect and holy God. That's our mission. Are you willing to be bold? Are you willing to fight for the souls of people? That means we're going to get a little uncomfortable. But that's what we have to do because that is a life on mission. And that's what we're to do is live a life on mission. So if you're here this morning and you need Jesus, we'll fight for you. As we stand and sing in a moment to end our service, you can come forward. You can come after service and talk to me or one of our elders or Scott. We'll fight for you. In church, Christians, are you willing to join me as we go and we fight for the souls of those that are outside of this building? If you are, let's do it. That's a life on mission. Let's pray. Father, I thank you and I praise you for this opportunity that we have to study your word, to see how you worked in the early church. It's just amazing, God. May we be that church. May we honor you and worship you and minister unto you, God, that you may strengthen us by your spirit to go and to live on mission. I pray for anybody in this room this morning watching online that if they do not know you, God, that today would be the day that they are filled with your grace. We love and we thank you, Jesus. It's your name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Go be blessed. Love you all.